For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? Well, those of you who follow this show, and I appreciate that, you know that all this month I am celebrating National Book Blitz Month. And the purpose of this month is really to get kids and everyone, from that matter, reading again, because a lot of people don't read the way they used to. I'm not one of them because I read uh, my friend Aaron, who's been here a few times. Uh, all my friends who know me personally know that my room is filled with books. As a matter of fact, I have just put new bookshelves in. Uh, just before the holidays, I was reading about this incredible book called Visual Thinking by Temple Grandin. And I reached out and when she said yes, uh, I was blown away because I have been a fan of hers for so long. And the fact that she said yes to me today uh, has kicked my 2023 off to a great start. We are celebrating books today. We're going to celebrate Temple in a few moments. But before I bring her on, I would like to celebrate some of the authors that I have celebrated on this show since we first began this show at the beginning of COVID. Here they are enjoy just seeing some of the titles. And if you see a title that you like, go out and buy a book and give it to a friend. Here they are. Happy New Year, Temple. Great to be here. I am so glad you're here. As I say, I raise a cup to you. Uh, I am such a fan of yours. And the fact that you are here and I get a chance to talk with you is a huge thrill. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, and I begin all my shows by asking my guest, who or what are you celebrating today? Well, what I'm super interested in, the reason why I wrote Visual Thinking is I want to help the kids that think differently to get into great careers where they can really make a contribution. Well, you certainly have made a great contribution, and I appreciate your saying this. I was talking uh, to a friend of mine last night, Danielle, who's actually going to pop in a little bit because she has a question that she'd like to ask you. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things that I was saying to Danielle, and I understand that in our country and in the world, uh, actually, that because of the number of kids that are going to school and everything, uh, we put kids into a classroom and then we begin to tell kids that they need to learn at the same pace and they, they learn to need, uh, learn on the same level across the board. And I find that that is such a disservice to kids living what I call their authentic selves. I'd love to get your take on that. Well, my mother, always encouraged my abilities. My ability in art showed up maybe when I was seven or eight years old. You know, I had severe autism as a young child. I had, did not talk until age four. But when around eight, art ability started to show up and mother always encouraged it. And I would just uh, do the same horse head over and over again. Mother would say, let's do the whole horse. Let's do the stable. She took that interest and broadened it. She encouraged me to use different media such as paint rather than just doing pencil. It's really important to develop kids where they have an area of strength. And the thing about autism is the child's going to be really good at one thing and totally terrible at something else. And we need to work on building up the thing the kid is really good at. For me, it was art. For another kid, it might be mathematics or music. But that's true of all kids, whether they be autistic or not. I mean, when you were a young child, uh, it I would like to know a little bit about your parents in terms of how they were processing the fact, because most 
kids, a lot of kids begin to start verbalizing around, uh, you know, one and a half, two years old. This didn't happen for you right away. No, it didn't. And for your parents, what was that? And we didn't know about autism at that time. Well, fortunately, my mother took me to a neurologist who recommended a little speech therapy school that two teachers taught in their home. And those teachers did all the good things <coughs> that teachers do now. Taught me words, but they also taught me how to wait and take turns at games. Really important to learn how to do that. Then lots of basic skills, like eating with utensils, putting your jacket on, basic skills like that. That's what was done with me when I was three years old. Now, on your website, you actually have a breakdown yes, I do. Uh, uh, of things that were taught to you as a very young girl. That's right. Um, for those who have not been to your website, and I encourage everyone to really check out your website, uh, and I will bring that up. Can you talk a little bit about those uh, various skills that you were taught as a very young girl? Well, when I was, uh, I can remember not being able to talk. I wanted to, I, wanted, I knew what I wanted to say, but I couldn't get it out. When the grown-ups talked really fast, it went right into gibberish. Like, blah, 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 blah. in fact, I thought the grown-ups had their own special language. So when you're working with these young children that are not talking, slow down when you talk to them. Slow down. The other thing you've got to do is give the child time to respond. They're kind of like a phone that's only got one bar of service. It's going to take it a while to download the web page. Give it time. Give the kid time to respond. Might be 15, 30 seconds. That's a long time. Now, you do mention that at a very early age, you had a, an affinity for art and you started uh, manifesting your art. In what modalities was the art manifesting itself in? Well, it started out just in pencil. Then mother uh, encouraged watercolors, pastels. She encouraged a lot of different media. It's very important to take the thing the kid's good at and broaden it. Now, the thing about autism is you've got ones like me that become verbal. Then you have some that remain nonverbal. Some of them can be good musicians or artists. But a kind of basic principle is skills will be very uneven. You might have somebody that's an extreme artist or extremely good mechanical things. In fact, art and mechanics go together. Mm -hmm. You might have a kid that's super good at math. Math and music tend to go together. And, and they tend to be uh, more uneven. I'm good at one thing and terrible at something else. Now, when the verbalization began to happen for you, what was the response within your own family? I mean, your parents, I mean, the first time they heard you speak must have been like an eureka moment for them. Well, then my words came in gradually one word at a time. What parents need to do if they have a child that's not talking, regardless of the diagnosis, rule out deafness. You have to make sure they're not deaf. Rule out some correctable problem with their tongue or something physically being wrong. And then... Um, I always encourage the kid to use their words. You know, the child wants a juice, now say the word. Mm -hmm. Get them to ask for it. <coughs> so that children learn that um, words can get things you want. So first of all, start just teaching words for stuff the child might be interested in. Food, toys. And even though you weren't verbalized, yeah. as you uh, got older... Were you able to verbalize more so through your writing? Because uh, you are a brilliant writer. Well, in some book, a lot of books I have had a co-writer. But I've, I, have, I have a book called The Way I See It and Thinking in Pictures. There was no co-writer for those books. Mm -hmm. Now, when I did visual thinking, I wrote all the rough drafts. And then Betsy, my highly verbal co-author, she rearranged it and smoothed things out. So mm -hmm. we were using complementary skills. And the thing that motivated me to work on this new book on visual thinking, what motivated me was um, I realized we were had a serious problem with skill loss. And I observed this right before COVID hit. I went to a poultry plant and two pork processing plants, and all of the specialized equipment had come from Holland. And it goes back to their educational system. When the kid's a teenager, they can decide to go university route, or they can go the more skilled trade tech route. And there's a tendency here to think of that as sort of a lower form of intelligence. It's not. <coughs> the people that are good at inventing mechanical equipment often can't do algebra. They wouldn't be able to graduate from high school. But they're patenting and inventing equipment. I've worked with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And it's a different kind of problem solving. You just see how to solve a problem. You just see it. In fact, yesterday I was at a travel a company that does travel website, and we were discussing how to help blind people and deaf people through the airport. And I just thought of some really simple things you can do. For the blind person, I want to make this an app called Gate Finder. So as they walk through the terminal, their phone will speak out the gates as they go by them. I think I can do it with some really inexpensive transponders so I can stick on the signs that come out of another industry. Simple, I just lost. That's, that's how I think. It's it's association, it's associational. I don't calculate, I just see it. I just lost a very dear friend of mine last year, Peggy Eason is was her name. And she was born blind. She was 72 when she passed away. Her entire life, she was blind. But the way that she navigated through life was complete. I mean, the one thing that she never wanted anyone to refer to her as was handicapped because she did not see herself as a handicapped person. She was a highly functioning, uh, very intelligent woman who went through life the only thing was that she could not see colors and visual things the way that you and I can. But I would talk to her about the way that she experienced colors. And she had an entire vocabulary <clears throat> for colors that most sighted people don't have. Well, I thought you said she was totally blind. She was. Okay. Okay. And then maybe uh, uh, I had a blind roommate when I was in graduate school. And um, I could, I was amazed at how she could navigate with the cane. She just had to be shown a new route to her classes once. And she remembered what the ground felt like using, feeling with her cane. One of the things that Peggy used to do was when you handed her money, she would ask what the denomination was. And each denomination, she had a way of folding it. That's right. And my roommate did the same thing. Gloria did exactly the same thing. Yes. Um, and she was a musician. And so was Peggy. Yeah, because that's something uh, where the blindness doesn't affect that. Like Stephen Hawking said, the famous scientist, right before he died, he told the New York Times, concentrate on those things. Your disability does not prevent you from doing really well. He could do math in his head and not much else. But he did math in his head brilliantly. Be, I want to get back to your book in a moment, but before we go there, I want to know how the work began that you do uh, as an animal behaviorist, because that's a whole other realm of your life uh, that uh, is just incredible, brilliant work that you do. Well, the first thing I looked at was what are cattle looking at when they go through a system? Now, at the time that I started this, I did not know that other people did not think in pictures. I think totally in pictures. Everything I think about is a picture. I thought everybody thought that way. And then I learned that a lot of people um, think verbally, but I didn't know that to my late 30s. And so I'd get down to see what cattle were seeing. And they often would be afraid of shadows. Here's a shadow right here um, that was in, that appeared in one of the big plants I worked on last spring. Now that was not there at 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. three o'clock in the afternoon i call it the spider monster that uh -huh. shadow appeared and the cattle refused to walk over it so to fix that they're going to have to put a roof over the facility and so that the overhead structure doesn't make a shadow in the afternoon <coughs> and i've done a lot of work with improving slaughter plants and people always, they know they're going to get slaughtered i can tell you in this plant they were much more afraid of the shadow monster Oh and they absolutely refused these cattle decided they were not going to walk over that. So the cattle handling went from beautiful and smooth and everything to horrible when the spider monster appeared. They that that fear was instilled in all of them. Well, I they if the leader stops, the others don't go. No, they had to put a roof over it to get rid of that shadow. Well, but, they, they took have they have any to idea what it was that was causing that image to create oh, the fear? It, yes, it was the overhead structure that made the shadow. And you could fix it by changing the overhead structure. You'd have to figure mm -hmm. out another way to brace a gate they had in there. That's what that, the, it was a bracing system for a gate is what that shadow was. Now, they just put a roof over it to get rid of it. 
I want to talk a little bit about your process. There are things that you, I think, discovered about uh, visual thinking writing this book. At least that's the sense that I get uh, from reading the book. Um, and as I said, I've got notes that I, I was taking. <laughs> There's so much to cover in here. We're not going to cover in an hour. Everyone buy this book. It's amazing. But that you discovered that more and more people really operate uh, with visual thinking than don't. Well, that's yeah, most so-called, most people are kind of mixtures between object visualizer like me, who thinks in photorealistic pictures, very specific, visual spatial mathematical thinkers, they think in patterns. That's your music and math mind, and then verbal thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, Betsy, my co-author, was totally, totally verbal. Everything she thinks about is words. And we've both learned a lot about each other. Um, you know, and she can organize things so much better. But the verbal thinker leaves out detail. The verbal thinker will have a broad concept about something. Where my mind thinks specifically, how can I solve a problem? And I will see a solution. Okay, going back to the uh, gate finder for the uh, person that's got vision, vision impairment. I see little transponder stickers stuck on the gate signs. Off-the-shelf transponder stickers that will trigger the app on the phone as they walk by it. That's amazing. And I just see it. I'm also seeing that I have to label those stickers so that maintenance doesn't think there's some rubbish and scrapes them off. Of I'm course. also thinking of that. Now, what was the process of you and Betsy coming together? Uh, had you worked together prior? Yeah. To Betsy worked with me. She was um, she was the editor for Doubleday that bought my um, one of my first early books, Thinking in Pictures. And I wrote that myself, but Betsy, as an editor for Doubleday, did a lot of rearranging of things. And then she left Doubleday and became a book agent. And, and I've done other books with her. She's sold. I did them with various co-authors. And then I had been to these plants where the equipment came from Holland. I also went to the Steve Jobs Theater just before COVID, you know, locked everything down. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and the glass walls and the roof were from Italy, Germany, and the roof came from Dubai. And then I found out that the state-of-the-art electronic chip-making machine is from Holland. And this goes back to their educational system. We have a tendency to kind of stick our nose up at the skilled trades. I worked with people that barely graduated from high school that had 20 patents on complicated equipment in big meat companies. It's a different kind of intelligence. They just see how to make something work. They just see it. Do you think it's based on the way that they are educated or where does that come from? Well, uh, visual thinkers get better the more data you load into the database. Okay, when I got thinking about my gate finder app, I spend a lot of time in airports. I know exactly how the gates are set up. And I, and I actually take specific airports and I walk through them. Now, in order to be able to do that, I would have had to have gone to all those airports. Right. You see, a visual thinker works best if they have lots of pictures in the database. One of the examples... And then I can recombine those pictures together in different ways and go across industries. One of the examples that you use in your book, if, for example, is uh, imagine a kid coming to your house and taking your computer completely apart, you know, bit by bit. And, I mean the average person would be furious if that was to happen. But this could be some genius that's com coming up with something. Well, especially you know, put it back together again and it worked. And then it it work better. <laughs> but you see, a visual thinker sees the solution to the problem. I also have a whole chapter in there on risk. And one of the examples was Fukushima. Yes. Engineers calculate risk. I see it. Simple watertight doors would have saved it. Because the electric emergency cooling pump is not going to work when it's flooded. You see, they didn't see it. Water going in there. They did a perfect job of making it earthquake proof. That worked perfect. And then 20 minutes later, the tsunami drowned it. Wow. Wow. You see, that's seeing a risk. I want to ask you, uh, Tipple, 
what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about autism in the 21st <laughs> century? I mean, at the time- the of the big problems you got with autism is you're going, Einstein had no speech to three. He would land in an autism program today. Michelangelo was probably autistic. Now, the other thing that's really important is that students have to get exposed to things. Mm -hmm. Michelangelo dropped out of school at age 12. He was running around in all these churches that were commissioning fine art. And he grew up with stone cutting tools. That's the exposure. Exactly. Then later on, you get the mentoring. But you have to start with the exposure. I got involved in the cattle industry because I got exposed to it when I was a teenager. I came from the East Coast. We didn't even have cattle there. You also talk, uh, you know, about some of the mentors that you had along the way when you were a young girl. I mean, going to a friend's house and having dinner. I mean, there are certain things that we learn as children across the board in terms of right and wrong and what's good and what's bad. Along those lessons, you can expound a little bit upon that. I was brought up in the 50s where grown-ups corrected children, no matter where you went. And you were given instructions, like, let's say, um, I didn't take wait my turn at a game. Then uh, my mother would say, let your sister take her turn. Learn how to take turns. A lot of these kids have problems with that. And well, okay. I, I'm going to guess that 20% of the people that, that built equipment for me and uh, also drew up plans for equipment were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. And they owned big metal fabrication shops because they grew up doing skilled trade stuff, welding, and that kind of stuff in high school. And those metal shops are not getting replaced. We've got a gigantic shortage of people to fix escalators and elevators. Next time you see somebody working on that stuff, you're probably going to see a lot of gray hair. <laughs> and they are, and we can talk about gray hair because I've got it. So oh, I'm, I have to. You've got gray hair too. Yes, but and the I problem heard it. is is that those people are not getting replaced. That kid who might be really good at fixing elevators is playing video games in the basement. You know how you can get them off the video games? Mechanics. This has been successful, and they find out that mechanics is more interesting than video games. But I love the fact that you say that. Growing up in the 50s, I grew up, you know, a decade later in the 60s, but I also had that. I mean, my parents, uh, there were rules that we lived by. That's right. You know, my, uh, I respected my teachers in school. Yeah. My dad always went to school with me the first day of the school, and he introduced me to the teacher and said, from the moment you walk into this classroom, they are your parents. That was instilled in me all yeah. through school. And we were taught you and myself, we were taught boundaries. Yeah. And I feel that a lot of kids, uh, regardless of where they are in life, most kids, I think that the world is in the shape that it's in now uh, because of a sense of entitlement, number one, and the fact that boundaries are not being placed on these kids. Well, I think that definitely is part of it. Kids are also growing up without doing hands-on classes. I get asked all the time, what would I do to improve the schools? I'm going to put in all the kind of classes I had as a kid in elementary school, woodworking, sewing, cooking, art, music, theater. Now, I didn't care about acting in the play, but I loved making scenery and costumes. Oh, thank you for saying and, that. And then um, in high school, welding, uh, shop, um, drafting. I, how can kids get interested in that stuff if they don't get exposed to it? And this is why the equipment is coming from Holland. It goes back to our educational system. What I have found on building a complicated food processing plant is the mathematician degreed engineer does boilers, refrigeration, wind load, snow load on the roof, power, water, and boilers and refrigeration. And then my kind of mind who can't do higher math and get an engineering degree is making all the packaging equipment, making all the mechanically clever equipment. Okay, let's look at where you have robots doing stuff. I just saw a thing where robots in Business Week magazine, robots making pizzas. Well, what people forget is that's a mechanical device controlled by a computer. Don't that's say right. who's that Nobody computer. Nobody created that computer. There's two parts of this. 
my kind of mind can make the tools and the programmer programs the, the robot. You see, you have to have both. Absolutely. A McDonald's just opened in Texas that is completely computerized. I'd be very interested to see that. Yes. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to operate. Uh, but I want to talk about something that just happened to you recently, and congratulations on this. You just had a statue created for you. And that was made by um, uh, one of our a retired professor, David Anderson. And um, he took up uh, making sculpture when he retired from academia. That is just, uh, and the likeness is, I mean, it's unbelievable. Oh, no, he, he did a fabulous job on that. And he did it pretty much off of photographs. How did you end up at CSU? Well, I ended up there, I'll be 32 years in March. After I got my PhD at the University of Illinois, I knew the philosophy ethics, animal ethics professor at CSU. So I called up Bernie Rollin. I said, I'd like to work part-time at CSU. So he arranged it for me to do a seminar. And they hired me uh, in the beginning, only quarter time. And I started teaching a class in livestock handling, where I, things like the shadows and, and the cattle behavior I talk about, but they also do a scale drawing. And they also, I have an internet project where they pick out interesting subject and animal behavior, and they got to get me journal articles off of different databases and summarize them. Now, I want to go back to, I mean, you, you, this book uh, was also uh, being written uh, as uh, COVID was hitting the world. Well, this book, the visual thinking, you know, uh, the hidden gifts of people who think in pictures, patterns, and abstractions, this was done during COVID. This was our big lockdown project. Yes, but I, so I want to ask you, I mean, was did this come about as a result of COVID? Well, I might say COVID facilitated it because I was grounded for an entire year. All of my speaking engagements were canceled. Well, a lot of them went online. Mm -hmm. But when you take the travel out, I had lots of time. I did not fly for an entire year until I was vaccinated. I'm in my 70s. I didn't dare fly. And then after I got vaccinated almost a year later, I'm... Um, a few events were coming back and I started, you know, getting on the airplanes again. No, but, uh, it, it was, uh, and Betsy, the same thing, her, her, um, uh, her agency uh, office in New York was shut down and she was at home and she was still doing, you know, some other authors and things, but she had plenty of time. And I called up Betsy and I said, what about you do a book? And I started telling you her about that, those trips, the poultry plant, the, the two pork plants and the Steve Jobs theater. Mm -hmm. And then the chip making machine. And I said, that, well, I want to address the skill loss issue. And you need us people that can't do algebra. But if I was in California, I wouldn't be able to graduate from high school. And when I was doing a book signing for visual thinking out in California, they had one of the talks in the school and I talked to the principal and he didn't even know that my kind of mind exists. <laughs> You know, a lot of people think you have to have algebra to do logical thinking. No, that's not how I think. <laughs> Thank that's God. not how I think. I solve problems. Like going back to that gate finder thing, I'm thinking about off-the-shelf RFD tag technology that I can stick on the gate signs. And I'm going to have to have some software made. But a lot of things that would help um, the uh, is, is just getting all the airline apps on the phone. You know, let's think of simple things we can do to make accommodations work, we actually can get people to do it. And this is what I did with my livestock stuff. Um, I thought I could fix everything with equipment. I had lots of equipment out in the industry. And the way I sold jobs is I just would show people my drawings. Oh, it's amazing. I would simply would show off my drawings. And, but equipment's not automatic management. And then I got hired by McDonald's to, um, implement animal welfare auditing of large meat plants. And I figured out a very simple scoring system. It worked. It was very simple. The other thing I've learned and the, is that I could make most of the places get a high standard of animal welfare with simple stuff, management, training, maintenance of equipment, and simple changes, non-slip flooring, and doing things like getting rid of the shadow monster. Uh, those kind of simple simple things. And most of the plants did not have to buy expensive stuff. Wow. That's amazing. I think, you know, when I hear you speak and I look at your history and everything that you've accomplished, it seems to me as if the word no 
is not a part of your vocabulary. One of the things that motivated me to do the dipping vat projects that were shown in the HBO movie Temple Grandin mm -hmm. is I wanted to prove to people I was not stupid. A lot of people thought I was stupid and I wasn't going to amount to anything. I had a gigantic motivation to prove I was not stupid. And the biggest barrier I had in the early 70s in the cattle industry was being a woman. Oh, that was 10 times the barrier over autism. And <laughs> where I had most of the problems was with the foreman level of management, middle management. That's where 90% of my problems were. It was not the owners of the places. It was not the line employees. It was being a woman. Yep. The discrimination oh, yeah. in this country. Well, I got bad stuff for being a woman. I had bull testicles put on my car. That actually happened. Amazing. Just absolutely amazing. I want to talk about another one of your books that you've written, uh, which is also amazing, and that's Navigating Autism. Nine Mindsets for Helping Kids. Okay, now the thing about, the reason why I did that, and, and was Deborah Moore, she was a co-author. She had a lot of writing on that book. But parents and teachers get locked into the label, and they don't think the kid can do anything. <coughs> and I see too many parents overprotect their kids. You've got fully verbal kids that are not learning things like shopping, bank account, laundry, just basic skills. They're not learning these things. They get so locked into the label or they don't think to, a, to develop a kid's math talent or music talent or art or mechanical talent or some other talent they might have. They do everything for the kid. And that book is to address that problem. I don't get into the different kinds of thinking there. That's mainly to address what Deborah Moore calls label locking. Mm -hmm. where the people just can't see past the label. See, the people that I worked with that owned metal companies, I, I have to be vague about what they make because they're not disclosed. But I can think of two of them, 20 patents each, and they were very autistic. Well, Owning companies that made up, stuff that people are using now. You bring up a very important point, and that's the label uh, making that we have in this country. And it's across the board with everyone putting labels on us. You said earlier that the most important thing for you early on was to prove, and you know, and you know, and it bothers me that you had to prove this, um, to prove that you were not stupid. No. Did someone verbally come right out and say that you were stupid? Well, a lot of people thought I wasn't going to amount to anything. And a lot of people <laughs> where are they now? And I can remember when I did some of my really nice drawings. Like this is a drawing I did, this drawing I did in the late 80s. And I did a drawing in the late 70s. That was a super nice drawing, as nice as that one. Mm -hmm. One of my very best drawings in the 70s. And I remember looking at that drawing and going, I did that. Stupid person would not be able to do that drawing. I remember looking at that drawing. I was in my old apartment in Arizona on Apache Boulevard, the Oasis Apartments, which I renamed the Oasis Building. And I was in Suite 218. So my stationery looked more official. But I remember. Well, let me tell you, that's something that, I mean, I do not have any skills whatsoever in terms of drawing. Okay, uh, but you have skills in other things. I have skills in other things, which I am proud of. I mean, I was having a conversation with someone at church on Sunday, and he said, are you the best at what you do? And I said, I absolutely am. And I know that I'm the best at what I do in certain areas, and and I wear those uh, hats proudly. Uh, there are so many hats that you wear, and you are so brilliant at what you do. I can't imagine <laughs> anyone, even as a child, calling you stupid. I can't do algebra. So I can't either. Right, but in some states, I wouldn't be able to graduate from high school. And the other thing is the people out in the shop that are making all the mechanically clever equipment, they can't do algebra either. You see, there's two parts of engineering. There's the clever engineering department, shop people, and then there's the degree engineer that calculates. But unfortunately, Nobody told the degree engineers to put watertight doors on Fukushima. I also have the uh, Boeing Max mess in there. Let me tell you, the new Maxes are nice. Best luggage bins in the industry. Oh, you can get every bag on them. Beautiful. I'm very, very, uh, I go on that plane all the time now. But the original problem with that was a visual thinking mistake. And I was just in Seattle the other night. 
And when I was on the plane, I sat next to a Boeing engineer and we discussed it. And the engineer told me that the mechanic in the shop warned them and they didn't listen. Because he wasn't a, probably a degree engineer, it was just a mechanic. But you see, the mechanic could see the angle of attack sensor getting busted off. Then what does the computer do? It thinks it's stalling when the plane's flying straight. Great points. Great points. Now, you see, that seeing risk instead of calculating risk. You better listen to the people in the shop. Absolutely. Tip, well, I want to bring on um, my friend Danielle. Uh, she's been waiting patiently in the okay. way. All right. Um, she reached out last night. She's a huge fan of yours, by the way. Uh, and uh, Danielle is a uh, psychic medium, and she has uh, a question that she would like to ask. All right, okay. Yes. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Richard. Nice to meet you, Dr. Grandin. I First, I would love to just thank you and your mother, actually, for both of your works and lectures and books. Uh, since the movie, I've deep dived into all of that. And yeah. I don't think there's been anything that's helped me understand my own neurodiversity like the two of you. So okay. really, truly, thank you. Um, I was also wondering, and I'm not asking anyone to believe in the psychic medium aspect, like Richard said, I hope it doesn't offend you as a practical scientist, because I love the sciences very much. Okay. But I was I was wondering, um, my neurodiversity, I believe, plays a part in that ability and in my visual thinking ability. Um, if I'm connecting with another energy, I'm seeing everything visually. Um, like, for example, I scored 14 on the test from your latest. Uh, okay, book. and that's visual thinking. Yes. And, and I'm, you see, because I visualize uh, something that might be a risk. Okay, let's do a real simple thing. I went into the beautiful corporate office of the travel company, and um, they had this water sculpture in the floor, and I'm going, I don't want my bag getting into that. Yeah. Okay, that's just a simple example of seeing risk. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I believe that part of me, that visual thinking part, it also helps me to see into people's energy uh, patterns and behavioral patterns. And uh, I've found a lot of correlation in my personal life and work between on the spectrum brains and these extrasensory um, abilities or paranormal perceptions. And I was wondering if you've ever found links between those things in your life or work. So well, basically, I just think about everything visually. Like if you look at the HBO movie, Temple Grandin, the yeah. word shoe is said, and a whole bunch of shoes come up like PowerPoint hmm. slides. But then it's possible to get off the subject. I can think about where I wore a particular pair of shoes. And then maybe it was, might be on the beach. And now I'm getting beach pictures from childhood. Right. Everything appears linked. Yeah. Yes. It's associative, but it has... A, you know, the associations are reasonable because then I'm thinking yes. about where I was wearing that shoe. Right. There's a, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, there's an old movie with Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy desk set uh, where they're on the roof and they're comparing her brain uh, to the computer's brain uh, in the fifties. And she talks about associating many things with many things. And now we would know that to be on the spectrum, but that immediately spoke to me as well as the See, way you described it. It's not linear, it's associational. Right. Now the more pictures I put in my database, the older I get, the better I'm able to think because I have more things that the Google inside my head can search. Yes. You see, this is why it's so important to get these kids out uh, doing lots of things because that's going to put lots of pictures into their head. Yes, that's like, why I study many different types picture. of things. Okay, like right now, I let's say I'm thinking about going to the grocery store. I'm now seeing all the fruit counter, <laughs> like wooden box things. I'm seeing uh, uh, where the coffee is located in in the supermarket. I, th I think, well, I got to buy coffee. I got to buy some apples, some yogurt. Um, I, I'm seeing it, and I see it where it's located in my store. And have you found that uh, people who are more on the verbal end of the spectrum also can have sensory overload in the same way that empathic people can? Because I've well, seen a lot I of think there's the um, I've read some stuff on PTSD. Yes. And um, 
I they you know if you I don't think some verbal people some can suppress things. See, the verbal thinker tends to overgeneralize, have a big concept, but how do you actually do it? I talked to a lady that owned huge hydroponic growing uh, place, and then they hired disabled people, which I think is wonderful. And I asked her, where do you buy your nutrients from? She didn't know. That's something so basic. You don't have those nutrient solutions. Your whole thing is dead. It's yeah, down. Yeah. That's something I'm not talking about knowing who, you know, something that's not that important. But like, what would you do if you couldn't buy this stuff? Where else could you get it from? <coughs> See, that's the I, I found that a lot of Yes, I, I found that I love the, the new book uh, speaking about the amygdala size, because I've certainly found that as a neurodivergent person, uh, you know, the amygdala tends to rule things very often until, as you said, we get older and are more able to handle it. Have you uh, been doing any work with um, what have you done personally to kind well, of bring I've been on, that? Thinking in pictures, I've been on antidepressants for 40 years. And uh, when I got into my late 20s, colitis attacks were ripping my health completely apart, completely. And I went on a low dose of antidepressants in my early 30s, and the colitis cleared up. My body was no longer in a constant state of stress. And I've been on it for 40 years. And I've seen people that nice and stable go off of meds where they were stable with disastrous results. Wow. Uh, there's some privacy issues, so I can't go into the details. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course. Well, I want to ask you, since, you know, uh, you know, most of my shows, except this month, we're focusing on books, um, deal with the entertainment world. Okay. Uh, how did the movie come about? And when the movie did come about, did you work uh, as a consultant with them on the film? Yes, I did. The movie came about because Emily Gerson Sainz, mother of an autistic adult, more on the severe side, um, approached me and wanted to make this movie. And Emily Gerson Sainz um, took her 10 years um, to put the right team together mm -hmm. and get Mick Jackson, the director, Christopher Munger, the writer. And, and it came out really good because she wanted to be right. Visual thinking is shown accurately in that movie. All my projects are accurate. Now, there's some stuff they embellished on, but the most important things, the visual thinking and the projects and the main people are accurate. So I love mean, that uh, that your mother was actually able to also receive uh, that Julia Ormond, the actress who portrayed her, was kind enough to give her her Emmy that she well, won. No, for that was absolutely wonderful. Um, you know, and Julia Ormond really did a great job of playing mother when you know, obviously when she was a lot younger. Yes. And I think Strafer and David Strafer did a good job of playing Carl Lockin. Catherine O'Hara did a really great job of being Anne. Yeah. And I'm glad she looks like, yeah. like Anne. And I want to thank Danielle. I mean, I went and watched it last night, and it's such a great movie. It is, you know, everyone, it's out there. Just, you know, it's on uh, HBO on Ma uh, HBO Max. Uh, so, um, so, Danielle, is there anything else that you want to ask before we wrap up um, the conversation? Yes, I just want to clarify, if Dr. Grandin doesn't mind, um, I, I know that you speak about Nikola Tesla in your new book as well. And uh, it's my understanding that in his way of putting his visual thinking and his engineering together, well, he's a he brilliant, believed, brilliant engineer. Right. Uh, he believed from what I've read that he received some of those pictures from some sort of outside source. Do you have any thoughts about no, people I, he on just, the um, he, he was very interested in what things look like. Um, and and um, he was he was mainly a visual thinker and right. in engineering is absolutely brilliant. Now we're going to have to wait and see what happens with Twitter. You see, that's something that has a lot more social implications, which rockets and cars do not have. Well, you know, I'm glad that you brought that up, uh, Temple, because you do also talk about in the book uh, the fact that Elon Musk, as a child, was bullied. Um, yep. And Elon Musk himself was bullied. And by the way, this visual thinking was was published and distributed before Elon Musk bought Twitter. Yes. It's very important that everything with Twitter happened after 
the book was published. Now, yeah. when, when we do the paperback version, I'm going to have to just wait and see what revisions we might have to make. <laughs> yes, but you also we'll just have to wait. And see. You also were bullied as a child. Uh, I was bullied in high school. Horrible. Elon Musk was bullied. And the only place I was not bullied was friends through shared interests. Horseback riding, model rockets, and electronics. Those were places where I was not bullied. We've got to get kids involved in friends through shared interests. Another kid, it could be music or the band. It could be a chess club. It could be a Star Wars club. It could be a lot of different things. <clears throat> Theater. You you mentioned and, and again uh, you just went there uh, temple uh, you uh, theater um, theater is not just being in the spotlight theater is a sense of community uh, I'm an actor uh, but working uh, behind the scenes one of my first acting jo uh, jobs in New York was with the 13th Street Theater and working in that theater you had to be a part of the collective as they called it. So I cleaned the restrooms, yeah. I did the lighting. I did all the things behind the scenes, uh, which gave me the opportunity to do the great shows uh, that I did when they came along. I worked with Chaz Pomentary in that theater. <laughs> we did, uh, and he did the same things. He was cleaning and sweeping and doing all the things behind. But what it really teaches is a sense of community. Well, that, that's really important. What I did in theater, was I loved to make costumes and scenery. And I did that when I was in fourth grade, sewing costumes with my singer, so handy. My toy sewing machine actually sewed. When I was in high school, the play was trial by jury. I took big pieces of cardboard and made all the jury boxes and the judges stand. That's the part that I liked and how I participated in it. And it's great. And, you know, and I'm glad that you, you know, are shedding a light in your book also on bullying and, you know, and the fact it is important for us to get our children uh, into communities of shared interest. Oh, you see, that's the shared interest. Like one enterprising teacher started a Star Wars club for like a, a fourth grade kid mm -hmm. and that helped them to get friends. And that was an easy thing to do. Another kid, a mom said, oh, he's in band at school and loving it. And then another kid's getting totally bullied. Now, one thing that helped me in elementary school not to get bullied was the um, teachers explained to the other children, I had a disability that was not visible, like crutches or a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then high school was absolutely worst part of my life. <laughs> but once the teachers tried to explain this to the kids, did they pick up on that? or did Yes, they in elementary school, I was not bullied because the teachers explained to the kids. High school was just worst, worst part of my life. And Elon Musk was bullied. Yes. And uh, and pushed down the stairs. Yes, that's in your book, yes. Yeah, that's, uh... yes. I love that you also mentioned uh, a story, I believe it's in chapter three of the new book and also in Different Not Less about uh, the, um, woman that you know that wasn't diagnosed with Asperger's until after she began her career and how you both believe it to be a benefit actually that she wasn't diagnosed until after she got well, to that. Well, this is the thing is this gets back to navigating autism and the label locking. Right. And the question was, if you'd known you were autistic, would you have become a high up in the Intel corporation? That's computer science and programming. And where I'm seeing now, where the diagnosis helps an adult is with our relationships, because I have another book called Different Not Less. Mm -hmm. 18 people diagnosed later in life describing their experiences, and they all have decent jobs. And I think on the job front, it's holding back the fully verbal kids. On the relationship front, especially when they're a little older, that's where the diagnosis can almost be a relief, and it can be helpful. I had a lady come up to me at the Denver airport one time, and she said, thank you for writing thinking in pictures. I understand my engineer husband and it saved our marriage. Wow. And I encourage everyone to read Different Not Less as well well because of the public perception right now um, because of people making videos who are diagnosed later in life is that it's kind of a, a bad thing sometimes people mourn that they weren't diagnosed earlier well, um, yeah, but, and, and you see something that can be that can be helpful um, but some of the most fun stuff I've ever did in my life 
was sitting around with the other shop people and we were talking about how to build stuff. <coughs> Just talking about that. That was some of the most funnest stuff. And the people that I worked with had satisfying careers. You know, they've had, I, I, I'm not saying career is everything, but for me, my sense of who I am is career. I am a university professor. I am a designer. And I can take my skills and maybe apply it to helping uh, blind people and deaf people navigate airports because I've been in so many of them that I can just visualize, you know, RFD tags on the gates. I've got several different off-the-shelf um, RFD tags I could you try. And it would be, I also want to think about things that we could do that aren't super expensive, too. I, that's why my when I worked on improving animal welfare at slaughterhouses, uh, one of the reasons I was able to pull it off, very simple assessment, pro, where they had five numbers they had to make. If you had more than 1% of your cattle fell down, you failed the McDonald's on it. And, and we were able to fix most of the places with simple stuff. Out of 75 plants, only three had to buy expensive, really expensive stuff. Right. Very proud of that. And, that's and your work with animal doing. consciousness as well blows me away. I, I work with a lot of that uh, well, energy. Right. So, yeah. In the, in the uh, last chapter of um, visual thinking, I have a chapter on animal consciousness. Yes, I loved it. <laughs> and I find it hard to believe that some people might think a dog is not conscious. Oh, <laughs> mine certainly is. <laughs> well, I don't agree with that. But I think some of this gets back to very highly verbal thinking. A lot of highly verbal people have a difficult time imagining thought without words. That's the thing. How can you have thought without words? Well, the dog, uh, I, I can think about, okay, if I'm going to think about grocery shopping, I'm like seeing the stuff on the shelf I need. Have you seen there are, uh, there's a new technology with the dogs. They have little buttons and yes, their I owners know. train them. Yes, like what's the story with Bunny, I think uh, is a very popular one. And they actually are communicating and, and forming thoughts, speaking about their dreams and intruders outside. Well, yes, I've, I've, I've read that about the buttons. And yeah. <coughs> you see, it's a different kind of thinking. And it's right. more going to be more sensory based. I tell students, get away from words. An animal lives in a sensory based world, not a word based world. What is it seeing, smelling? This brand new research, and unfortunately, it's not visual thinking because it came out after the book got printed. But Cornell University did brain scans on dogs with the fanciest brain scanner. And they discovered that there's a gigantic internet circuit in a dog's brain that goes from the olfactory part of the brain to the visual cortex. Wow. Smell pictures, detailed smell pictures, three dimensional smell pictures. <laughs> It's oh, no, it's brand brand new. <laughs> That's brand new research. Cornell University Veterinary College. I love well, it. Thank you. Daniel, so I'm going to let you go so that I can wrap yes, up. Yes, thank you, Richard. Show. And uh, thank yes. you for popping in. Uh, it means a lot that you popped in. And Thank uh, you so much. Thank and you I'll both. let everyone know at the end of the show that you and I are doing a show together on Saturday night. So uh, everyone tune in for us. Um, I want to ask Kevin before we wrap everything up, uh, working with Betsy, this is a question since we are <laughs> celebrating National Book Blitz Month. Uh, when did you know that this book was ready for the public? Was it um, the publisher's decision? Was it your decision? It was mine. It was mine. I had done this trip and I went to those four places. And I remember standing in the middle of the Apple Theater screaming in the Steve Jobs Theater, we don't make it anymore! And the whole thing vibrated. And so the impetus for doing the book was the skill loss issue. And, and we are especially losing the skills on the object visualizers like me who are not able to do algebra. And, but it's a different kind of thought. And to make things... You need you need uh, both the mathematicians and the visual the pick object visualizers that think totally in pictures, and I'm concerned that a lot of these kids are getting screened out, and then you go look up Netherlands educational system Italy, 
Round 14, you can go tech route or university route. And Italy even has an art route. Wow. Because they have all that fashion industry. Amazing. Tim, again, I want to thank you for being here today. I'm going to give my closing remarks, and then I'm going to give you the final word today. Uh, it can be about anything that we talked about, anything we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any final message that you wish uh, that you want to leave everyone with. Everyone who's watching, you'll see on the bottom of the screen, uh, it says Ask Temple, and it's got her web address uh, uh, slash ask HTML. This is an aspect of her website that I love. You can go on and ask her a question and provide it upon her schedule. She will get back to you eventually. Feel free to reach out. Everyone get this book. Each day, as you all know, I pull a word for the day. And as I was prepping for today's show, the word that I pulled was clarity, that we all be clear as to who we are, what we're all about, where we desire to go. And, you know, Temple talks earlier about being called stupid when she was a small child. Uh, I was told also that I was a zero when I was growing up by people that I cared about. People, words have a lot of meaning. Uh, so we're talking about visual thinking today, but think about the words that you use when it comes to the people that you come in contact with. As you all know, I end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Reach out to somebody that you haven't spoken to in a long time. Order two copies of this book. Keep one for yourself and send one to that friend. And write a little inscription inside the book to let them know what they mean to you. It's important that we keep communication going with each other. Uh, not only today, but tomorrow, next week, and next year. Um, one of my uh, favorite uncles passed away yesterday. And then I found out this morning that another dear friend of mine passed away yesterday as well. Uh, life is precious. Hold on to these friends that matter. I have a dear friend. He says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, we are in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Some are in rafts, some are in sailboats, some are in yachts, some are in tugboats, pushing everything upstream. I don't care what size boat you're on, just make sure you have a skipper by your side. Temple, I'm a huge fan of yours, and it means the world to me that you said yes to me. Uh, and I'm going to leave the screen, and I'm going to let you have the final word, and when you say goodbye... I will end the show. You have nothing to worry about on how to get out. So okay. it's all yours. Thank you. Well, I have people ask me all the time, what's the most important thing they can do to learn about different kinds of minds? And the first thing is you have to realize that they exist. I talk, I tell that to educators, corporate leaders all the time. And the reason why I did the book, Visual Thinking, is I want people to know that different kinds of minds exist also. The different kinds of minds can work in complementary manners on many, many different kinds of projects. And we need all the different kinds of minds. But the first step is realizing they exist. And a lot of people are mixtures of the different kinds of minds. But you get somebody with a label like autism, dyslexia, ADHD, then they often will be more extreme, maybe an extreme mathematician, an extreme object visualizer who would be good at art and mechanics. So... The world really does need all the different kinds of minds.